Well, welcome to Mending Place of South City. My name is Pastor Gates. So glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, for those of you who are first timers with us in the room online, I pray that you would receive what God wants for you this morning, that it wouldn't be something that you're just going through the motions. Uh, sometimes we got, uh, during this season or holiday, we got people who show up to church just through Christmas, Easter, Mother's Day, you know, that type of, uh, that type of follower, those who follow from afar. But we've been in a series that talks about really the foundation and the core of what should be a Christian walk, a Christian life. And that starts with faith, hope, and then today we, we end this with love. When you think about the scripture that we've been using as our foundational text from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, it says that at some point in time when everything else is washed away, when everything else is, is mo- removed from the earth or things in life fade or what was new has become old, what, has, what was once popular is forgotten, that these three will remain. And that's simply faith, hope, and then charity, the King James Version says, but love nonetheless. When we think about love, uh, I, I want to just take a moment to, to define love for us because it is an often misused, it's probably the most often misused word in, in, in the English language. Uh, many of us say we love everything. How many of you have ever said you, you just like, man, you know, even, I, even now see people who, who kind of in the street life, they say love before they leave each other. So, I mean, it's like, you know, I love you. I love Flintstones. I love Scooby-Doo. I love... I love, uh, I love this, I love that. We say we love everything. Uh, I, I know people who've known each other for about two to five minutes and they just say, oh, I just love you. And you start asking yourself, when we say love, what do we mean? What do you mean when you say love? What do you mean when you say that I love you or I love this or I love that or they love me? It's important for you to be able to articulate that, define it. Because I believe there's a lot of pain in the world because we have misdiagnosed our love. We have misdefined it. We have given it a, a very weak name, a very weak meaning, and that has a, it has a great strong impact on us, but the meaning is not very, very good. Here's, here's an issue. When the Greeks were writing this, or the Bible that, as the New Testament has been written in, in the Greek language, translated in many other languages, they knew that there were different meanings for love. And so when we read the Bible, and even now when we read the Bible, and we see that this love or that love, and we see the, the word love, it's not the exact same word. There's different meanings for its use. Today, in this age, we often, in my opinion, we get the one, one particular type of love, and we just define it for all loves, and that's eros love, or pleasure, or sexual love. I'm going to read an article that I picked up, and I, just a portion of the article, that I think works best for our setting here as we define what love is. And we're going to share a little bit of what the scripture says. And I'm going to go in a text that I think is going to be, I mean, pivotal for our change and growth into 2021 and further as God just continues to provide for us in the coming years uh, and, and life. The ancient Greeks, here's the article. The ancient Greeks were just as sophisticated in the way that they talked about love recognizing different varieties, they would have been shocked by our crudeness in using a single word both to whisper I love you over a candlelit meal and to casually sign an email, lots of love. The first kind of love was Eros, named after the Greek god of fertility, and it represented the idea of sexual passion and desire. But the Greeks didn't always think of it as something positive. I want you to listen closely to this as they tend to do today. In fact, Eros was viewed as dangerous, fiery, and irrational form of love that could take hold of you and possess you, an attitude shared by many later or later spiritual thinkers, such as Christian writer C.S. Lewis. Eros involved a loss of control. Hear me clearly. Eros involved a loss of control that frightened the Greeks, which is odd because losing control is precisely what many people now seek in relationship. Haven't you heard someone say this? We fell madly in love. This idea that the love that we often see expressed during this this season of the year and that we hope to be refreshed and renewed as we go to come to the end of a year and then go into the beginning of a new year, we often, I think, mix it up with all kinds of different types of love. The challenge then is to think about the type of love that we're talking about specifically today. 
The love we're talking about today is a love that God had for his creation, the type of love that he has for you and I. And what this looks like today and how we then experience it today matters because then it paints the landscape or the filter for how we see all other types of love. And this is why you've heard me often say that you really don't know love until you've experienced the love that God has for you. You can't really accurately love someone until you've experienced the unconditional love that God has given to us. And then it gives us a way of measuring, engaging the depth or the quality of love that we're either receiving or not receiving from any level of relationship that we have in this life. So if we don't know this, which is the benchmark, the love that God has for us, then it's, we're, we're, we're liable to receive any type of love or accept anything from anyone because we don't have a real standard set for ourselves. And if we're using the wrong definition and we think love only resides between our legs or love only resides with, with uh, uh, some steamy, sultry idea that we fabricated or made up and said this is our benchmark, then what happens when our bodies fade? What happens when time changes things or our preferences changes? Then is love as fickle as our desires? No, not even in the slightest bit. Is love as fickle as our desires? If you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, you'll see that love is patient, love is kind, love is long suffering. Love, the love that we're talking about today is then described in the passage that I originally went to in the first two segments of the series. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is commonly called the love chapter, is defined there. But now, when we see today and age, sometimes we think love is is giving. We've got books that talk about love languages. Is your love love language touch? Is your love language gifts, words of affirmation, acts of kindness, quality time? If this, this is your love language, then that's what love means to you, or this is how it's best expressed to you or experienced. But today I'm gonna challenge and throw out something a little bit different as I want us to think about this idea that love is best seen when it's targeted. Anybody anybody ever been targeted? (laughs) You won't ever say that, like, been targeted. Uh, maybe, Maybe you feel like you were racially profiled, you were targeted. Maybe you felt like that you've been targeted by telemarketers or a marketing or media plan or program. Maybe you felt like you were targeted by uh, criminals with nefarious ideas or desires, people who wanted to get you or see you as an easy mark. Maybe you felt like that you were attacked by somebody because you looked like or acted like or they thought you had some things. If you've ever been targeted, you know what it's like to feel uh, that, that sense of tension, that there's something coming after you, there's something chasing you. And today we're talking to you about love that is targeted, that God is so intentional that he doesn't use the phraseology that his love is reckless. His love is not unintentional. His love is very intentional that he would then come after you specifically and it does not be a random idea. Love is a weapon that if it's turned towards you, then it's very intentional that God is targeting you. But if God God is targeting you, then it also then begs to us to think about the idea that if I'm being targeted by God, then I'm also being targeted by the enemy. Have you ever been targeted? Anyone ever felt like the enemy was out to get you? You specifically, that the devil himself, satanic influences were, were rising up against you. Things that were outside of your privy, things you couldn't see, you didn't understand. And when we start looking at the story of God sending his son into the world, it is a picture of being targeted. Mankind was being targeted by God. Now why is this important? We're gonna get there, but I wanna read a passage of scripture to you that confirms what I'm saying, and then I think gives a more in-depth picture of what took place as Pastor Darnell read Luke chapter two, and gives us a better picture of what that really means to have a baby born in a manger, in a barn, at night, in Bethlehem, shepherds watching, angels appearing in the sky, Here, to me, is a deeper look and picture of the love that's expressed in this story that oftentimes we just see a sequence of events, a timeline, it's linear, but more importantly, this is an eternal story that's just now being manifested in time. Have you ever thought about that? That for someone who is eternal, there really is no beginning and there's no end. So when God says that he's eternal, there is no starting place or stopping place 
that you and I might need as a form of reference, but we see him interjecting himself now in time through the womb of a woman now in Bethlehem. But to me, this is the same story lived out further on in scripture in 1 John chapter 4. If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn there with me. I'm going to read a, a pretty chunk, a pretty big chunk, 14 verses. I'm going to read it relatively fast because I want you to get the big story here. This is a story of expressed love, of what look, love looks like, and a lot of the characters, characteristics we see in Luke chapter 2 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, they show up here again, just echoing this idea that God is consistent and love is not reckless. Anything that's reckless is, is haphazard. It's, it's, it's random. And God is anything but random. So, you know, you know, I've seen people do uh, drive-by shootings. I've been around and experienced what it looks like to be a part of a drive-by shooting. And it looks like I might be after one person, but the way in which the attack is played out, it looks very random. It's very wild and uh, unorthodox, not intentional. And some, some people may get shot or killed in the process, but they weren't the ones that they were targeting. It was someone else they were trying to get, but the other person got hit. If, the, if, if God operated like that, then imagine how many people would not be experiencing the things that they need to experience God, but God is intentional. He wants you to know that this is intentional, that him sending his son into the world wasn't random. And even now today, it's not random that you're here. It's not random that you're listening. It's not random that we are a part of this conversation we're having around faith, hope, and now love. First John chapter 4, 7 through 21, King James Version, not because it's super spiritual, even though it's Christmas. Verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's important for you to know. Is love is not just a part of his attributes, but at his essence, that is who he is. He is love. Like, uh, it is like the birthplace of love. Just like the scripture says that the enemy, Satan, the devil, is a liar from the beginning and is always a liar and will be a liar. It, that's unchanging. At his core, he is a liar. He can't change that. Just like God at his core is love and he can't change that. It's immutable. So he says, listen, verse 9, in this way manifested the love of God toward us. We've been talking about Christmas. We're talking about Jesus coming into the world. And so this is the conversation. In this way manifested the love of God toward us because that what? God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might what? Live through him. Monogeneus is the word for begotten, which means he's one of a kind. He's one of a kind. There's no one else in his class. He is the only begotten of the Father. He is special. He is unique. And the fact that God had a son that was birthed, he was not created. That's important for you to know. And this is, in, this is where the scripture says in verse 10, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the, the atonement for our sins. Beloved, this is where the writer says, beloved. He, I love that he keeps using this word beloved. He's like, man, you, just, you don't know how much you're cared for. Even in his writing to a people, he's echoing a principle and a tense of God's being. That listen, beloved, I love you so much. You need to know this. If you're going to do anything, you need to know this. As a matter of fact, when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says that love is the key thing. It's the most principal thing. That when it's all said and done, that this is the most resilient of things. Because God is this thing. If God is it, it, then God always has been. If he is love, then love then has the same attribute of eternity. It's eternal in nature. And it will not go away and it will not fade away. So when we see this, he says, verse 11, he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. And his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit and we have seen, this is important because we're talking about Jesus coming to the world and we have seen and do testify that the father sent the son to be the savior of the world. 
Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. How many times he said this is the second time that we see this. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Verse 17, herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That's important because in the day of judgment, I want to be able to stand boldly before the Lord as he judges the, the righteous and the unrighteous, as he judges the just and the unjust, as he separates the sheep from the goats. I want to be able to stand boldly. I will not be able to stand boldly on my own works as Ephesians chapter 2 talks about. I can only stand boldly on the grace of the fact that this was given to me. This was a love that was given to me. Didn't you say that in the song? One of the verses in the song was so perfect that we realized that we're singing about principles within scripture. This is why song is so important. That when we then hear ourselves saying these things, sometimes we hear ourselves saying them and we don't really realize that we're, we're standing in agreement with what God's word says, that the scripture here says that I can be bold at the day of judgment. Why is it important that God sent his son in the world? That you would be able to stand bold if we receive. That we would be able to stand bold at the day of judgment of saying that it's his work that I stand on. It's his work that I agree with. It's his work that gets me in. And it's his work that has caused me to have a relationship with God in the first place. At the day of judgment, many of us don't even think that far ahead. But some of us who are planning, we know that we need something more than our own works, our own ability, because as he is, so are we in the world. Verse 18, we're almost done here. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has what? Torment. Torment. Anybody ever been uh, anxious? Anyone knows what it's like to be tense? Anyone knows what it's like to try to wait on the results of something? <laughs> wait on the results of something. Oh, shoot, I don't know exactly what I've done, but I've got to go get tested. Uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in an era where Magic Johnson just came out with uh, his announcement that he had HIV. And uh, it, there was a fear that ran through our neighborhood, even young people. I was a teenager. Uh, but all the, those who were promiscuous and all those who had been hanging out and doing things they shouldn't have been doing, it was all of a sudden like, oh, if it happened to Magic, it could happen to us. And there was a level of torment that went through our young little community about what could have happened or what might be happening because you were being rough and wild. And all of a sudden we see that it could even reach to those who were popular or have fame or notoriety. And so it was a, a, a time of torment until we learned more about it. And it's the same way for you, your sin life, your sin nature, the same way for you when you think that you're going to have to do it all in your own work, your own part, when you realize that the torment that comes when I'm afraid of what I don't know and what I cannot expect, God says that this is a, a sign that you don't have love, not that type of that naughty love, not that pleasure love, not that self-seeking love, but the type of love that then gives us assurance and confidence that even at the day of judgment, I have no fear. So if I have no fear at the day of judgment, then guess where I shouldn't have fear anywhere else? In any other part of my life. Do you have that type of love? Do you understand that God has directed his love towards you, that it was not on accident? It was on purpose that he says that I sent my love to you. Do you think about the, all the phraseology that we've been reading? You hear this over and over again that I would what? I showed my love towards you. I sent my son to you. That what love then is directed. Love is not reckless, love is intentional. Love is directed to you and I, even now today. You need to be reminded of it. By why? Because this same characteristic should be there in your love that you can't be careless or casual in your love life either. You gotta know that you're loving the right thing, the right way, the right season for the right purpose. The scripture says we loved him, verse 19, because what? He first loved us. Gosh, powerful statement. We'll get some more in there. If a man say I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar for he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment, have we from him that he who loves God loves his brother also. If you will, just for your, just for giggle sakes, if you see verse 11, verse 11 says something interesting and I want you to see this because we're going to talk about this idea of love is targeted, love is progressive. When you see verse 11, it says what? Beloved, if God so loved us, what? 
we ought also to love one another. Almost like a suggestion. Like, you know what, this is something you should think about. Something that you should consider. And then when we get all the way down to verse 21, what it says. And this commandment we have from him. That he who loved God, loved, what? Love his brother also. How does it shift and transition from being a suggestion that you love to all of a sudden being a commandment that you love? Where does that happen? Somewhere in between where God is showing you that this wasn't random. He first gives you this idea that it's suggestive if you don't understand the purposefulness of it. And then all of a sudden, as he begins to explain how intentional God has been, he says, now you should know that this is a command. That you should know because you've seen the underbelly, the inside workings, the mechanics of this thing, that God goes first. That it's not something that you've created. It's not something that you could have bought with your own pride, with your own works, with your own ideas. This is something that was given to you. And because it was given to you, then a part of the equation is that it should be what? Given to others. One piece of the equation is, is that what? First, God gives. Secondly, you need to receive. The part that we fall short of oftentimes is what? That then it should be given back. You, you think that you can only just give and you should only just get. You should only get and you should only get and you should only get. And then when we start thinking about the quality of love given back, we fall short on it. Well, a lot of times when we look at the story of Jesus coming into the world, all we see is a baby in a manger, and we miss some of the principles that God's trying to show us through this whole idea, that if Christ is love, if God is love, and then Jesus is an embodiment of Scripture, John chapter 1, that if, if these things are true, then when we see Christ in baby form, move and mature and migrate into the adulthood, we should also believe that love does the same thing, that your love will transition and mature in manifestation, but not in principle. It's the same in principle, but when we go further along, we see that over time, love matures. It matures. It develops like from the baby in the manger to the man on the cross to eventually the man who would then be resurrected on the third day, who's seated in heaven, the right hand of the Father. Love progresses, it moves. It's never ending, it's limitless, as is its creator and the source of love, which is God. These principles and tenets are true to the love that we're talking about today. It's not that weak stuff. It's not the puppy love, no, it's not that. It's not faddish, it's not stylistic, it's not the things that would make you look good in front of other people. It's the type of love that endures and suffers. When we see the attributes of love, love suffers long. Who, who wants to have that part of love? Well, we like to receive that love. We would like to receive that type of love, long-suffering love. But when we start talking about love being something that then we model, do we like to give that type of love? That's another idea, another conversation, maybe for another time. Maybe you're not ready for that. But when I see this picture being elevated and lifted up, God shows us that your love has got to start somewhere. That you do not just go from here to there without there being a process through trial and through time. Jesus was tempted, your love will be tempted. Jesus was tested, your love will be tested. Jesus overcame, your love should overcome. You see how I'm saying here? That every time we see an attribute of Christ being antagonized or being ridiculed or being made fun of or being taken advantage of or someone trying to manipulate or overcome, love has the exact same willingness and should have the same willingness to overcome in your life. This is true. So when I see love, I have to look no further than the personification of love, which is Jesus Christ. And we see him in the baby in the manger now in this season as we reflect on him actually be entering into the world. But then we go a little bit further and we think about what is to come when our love is being perfected. Because perfect love casts out fear. I don't know about you, but I've not seen a baby cast out fear. <laughs> Anybody ever got into a fight and lifted your baby up? <laughs> Here, put that baby up. That baby is going to protect you. No, 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 no. That's not the thing that protects. But as we see the development and maturity of Christ, we see the cross and his passion eventually come to the point to where it's not only that it is given, not only received, 
but love returned. Mature folk know how to return love. Do you hear what I'm saying? It's not, a, it's not, you're not that mature because you receive love, but maturity comes when you can return it. I said I love you to my sons, my daughter, before they could even speak. I gave them love before they even knew what love was. I shared with them, I protected them, provided for them. They had no idea I was doing all those things, oblivious to it. And in doing that, they were what? I was giving love, they were receiving it. At some point in time in life, you hear what I'm saying? Let me look over here. At some point in time in life, they should do what? Return love. I've been given love, I have received love, and a sign of maturity is, is now I return love. But how many of you have been stuck in the receiving phase? I'm stuck in the middle. All I can do is just receive. But I'm short on giving. God shows us this model that it's not complete until it's returned. That's important for you to know. My heart hurts for everyone who just thinks about it getting and getting and getting and getting. How can I get more? And not thinking about returning. And I'm not talking about just gifts or presents. That's a picture of what we should be doing. We should be returning love. And we, we can do that well. I'm not, a, I'm not opposed to gift giving or receiving. I'm not saying anything against that. But that is just a model or a picture of what should be. It is this picture that we have at some point when we read the text that love eventually should be manifested. It should go from words to actual manifestation. It should go from types and shadows to actual appearings and being with and there in presence. That it should be no longer that I just talk a good game, but there is no sign or action that follows it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been in a relationship where someone said they loved you, but their actions didn't align up with their words? Anybody know that? Is I'm the only one? I'm the only one? You online? You get, okay. So you see what I'm talking about. How often have we been guilty of that? And I'm talking about we as me included, that I said some things, my thought pattern, my thought life, things that were unknown to other people were absolutely opposite of what I then actually would do. My hope is that you will be challenged this morning with the idea that the completion of love is in its giving, receiving, and then it's returning. It's not done yet until you can return it. It's not done yet till you can give it back. This is why the text in which we read is so filled with, if you don't love your brother, if you don't love people that you see every day, if you can't have care and compassion for people that you don't necessarily know or live in the same house, share the same genes as you or share the same likes or dislikes as you, you're really not exhibiting the type of love that Christ has. And matter of fact, the scripture goes as far as saying that you're a liar if you think that you love if you cannot love someone that you see. Because you're a liar. There's a difference between liars and lovers. There's a difference now even now as we have this conversation with what are we going to do with love? What are you going to do with love? And I'm not talking about that, you know, Mary J. Blige type of love. I'm not talking about Tina Turner type of love. I'm talking about the God kind of love, the type of love that says that I then am responsible to return it because I've been given it. That's a heavy responsibility. And I, I admit it's not easy that's why we have to pause on this word and say that you have to quit believing that this is a word that you should just throw around so loosely. I would, I would, I would challenge some people to start using it less in their vocabulary and start saying, I like these things. You know, I, like, I really like that. But I would challenge you not to use love so loosely so that when you say it, it really means something. In this day and age, we use it so loosely that it means nothing. We use it as a salutation. We use it as a goodbye. We say love, 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 and we really don't have a real clear understanding of the quality of love that it requires for it, this to be transformative. A transformative love requires a transformative sacrifice. And eventually, you'll get to this point to where you see that love has to be, if it's going to be directed towards, that love is directed in this way. So pastor, how do you get love directed? How do I get, how is it that love is directed toward me? Love is directed always in the dying. 
it's not in the living, right? So we were excited about Jesus coming into the world. We celebrate that now, and we should. But love is most celebrated, and it is directed towards individuals or things in the fact that the person says that love says this statement at its best, I choose you. And when love says, I choose you, it says that I then don't do other things, which means I elevate you over desires, over my own flesh, even over my own pain or discomfort. And we see Jesus doing that in the Garden of Gethsemane at some point in time. He has to say, I choose you. That is the end game and the maturing of love. It says that you chose me, God, and I didn't choose you. You chose me first. You sought me when I didn't even think about seeking you. When I was unlovely, when I was uncomely, when my righteousness is filthy and dirty and I had a stench about me and I couldn't be trusted, I chose you. You chose me. And here's the key, that love and a characteristic like this, love always goes first. (laughs) You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Love always goes first. Do you want to know if someone loves you? Do you want to know if someone's love for you is pure and genuine and sincere? Love always will go first. And I'm not talking about you doing tit for tat stuff. I'm talking about love is a reconciler. Love is long lasting. Love is going to say, I choose you again and again and again and again. If I love you, it's not about your perfection. It's about me choosing you. And this is modeled in this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. He says, I choose you because I choose you first. Then that's the only way that you can then choose me. It's not that complicated of an idea, but we, many times when we get down through and we start thinking about uh, what it looks like to have this characteristic lived out in my life, that we realize that love then has to start somewhere, and God shows us the model of going first with his love for us. We need to know that, that in the end of the day, that we are better uh, receivers at times than we are givers. But at some point in time, like I said, you should return. You should give it back up. Now, what I want you to see is this, that if love has a demand of any type, love's demand is simply that it would be returned. Love is on the go. It's on the move. It doesn't like to just get into your life and park, but love likes to be given. Love likes to be shared. Love likes to be spread. And this is why it hurts the heart of God when you say that you can receive love, but you hate your brother that you see. You want to receive a thing, but you can't then give a thing. And it it just confuses him to to no degree because he then has to ask himself, so how did you get? You had to be given it too by, by me, so then how is it that you then want to hold somebody else's feet to the fire and not be able to give it to them? This is in the day and age we live in where there's conflict and difference in siloed living, where people are this party or that party or this group or that group, this tribe or that tribe. This is a, a, an hour where we have to be reminded that love has been targeted towards you. Now here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna share something with you that I, I think is important about this idea. Why do you keep talking about this idea of being targeted, that it's intentional? What would you say to someone who says that I can't really control who I love? Seems very random, doesn't it? That we should be careful walking around town because you just never know who you may fall in love with. Wouldn't you say that? We gotta be, we gotta be careful. If people say, I can't control who I love, how many of you have ever heard that? I can't control who I love. I can't control what I love. I just, I'm just completely at the whim of love because love is so powerful. Love just takes over me and makes me do anything. Doesn't that sound a lot like the eros love that we defined earlier? The type of love that's reckless that the Greeks said is dangerous because it's like maddening and people just do whatever they want to do in that type of love. You start saying stuff like, I can't control who I love. And when you start saying, I can't control who I love, you start saying that anything is possible in my life. That creates anxiety because it could be a sidebar conversation. All of a sudden, you don't don't love me anymore. You love them. It could be that you found a car that you like more than me and you decided to get a, a big Lexus on Christmas and put a red bow on it and bring it to the front to the front of the house and say that you love. You, you, could, you could do all kind of stuff and say, you know what? It was, man, I don't know. It's not like the devil made you do it, but now you're saying the love made me do it. 
Love made me do it, and that should give me an out and an escape because I was in love. I love that thing. I love that person. I love that feeling. I love that idea. And now here I am. I am a victim, hear this, a victim of love. Isn't that something? If that's true, that we can't control who we love, and I hope that some of us might be able to agree that the opposite of love would be what? Hate. Or even maybe some of you say fear, depending on what school of thought you are in. Fear, though, at the core breeds hate. When we think about that, that if I can't control who I love, then you should also be able to say this is true, that I can't control who I hate. So you're just saying that you can't control that either then. If you can't control who you love, you can't control who you hate, and you can't control a whole bunch of things about your life. This is a real big issue especially in arenas where we start talking about same-sex attraction. I'm not harping on that. I just want us to bring this idea up that if it's just so animalistic, it is just this who I am, and I can't control any of those things, then it says that then there's other things that on the flip side, I don't control either. Here's the challenge with that thinking is if I'm out of control and I ascribe this idea to love, that love is out of control, then any, anyone who comes into a relationship with anyone is all by chance or random. Even your relationship with God, it's all by chance or random. I don't believe that. And that's not what the scripture suggests. And that's not even a conversation that many of us want to have because if I choose love and love chooses me, then that makes me responsible because I have choice. There is no love without choice. If you're forced to do, is it love? If you had no choice in it, is it love? Is it love if you see someone get married and they got handcuffs and chains on and they're, 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 they're at the altar? Someone got a shotgun behind them. You're gonna get married today. Is that love? No, there is no love without choice. And here's the beauty of where God has done his greatest work. If God is love, then he has to, by default, then give us a choice to either choose him or not. Love is a very vulnerable place to be. Because you can create it, you can give it, but it doesn't have to be received. God can be rejected. And God oftentimes is rejected. I'm guilty of it. I've rejected him more times than I'd like to admit. Not just when I was unsaved, but since I've been saved. I rejected his love. I rejected his wisdom. I rejected his, 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 his attempts to pull me from things, keep me from things. I resisted him. Anybody know what it's like to be rejected? We're talking about receiving today. I love that. Like, we, oh, the baby came into the world. I love that. But only when something can be rejected can it truly be love. The idea of a son coming into the world, that's beautiful. A gift given, but every gift that's given doesn't always have to be received. Every time I show kindness, it doesn't have to be reciprocated. Every time I show passion and compassion on someone, they don't have to say yes to it. They could reject it, laugh at me, scorn me to death, whatever it is. These are, all, these are all possibilities. And many times I think we keep love so superficial because we don't want to feel the pain of rejection when it's authentic and it's real. Do you really love me? Do you really care about me? Will you choose me not when it's convenient, but when it's inconvenient, will you choose me? That's what we're talking about. God asked the same question. Not when you feel like your life is flowing real well, will you choose me? But when things are haywire, and things are crazy and chaotic, and it would be easy for you to stand against me than it would be for you to stand with me, will you choose me? Will you give this idea of love a chance? Only through choice can we really see love. Only through love, only through choice can we see love. My hope and my heart's desire 
is that as we think about this season and every gift you get, I'm praying that there be an imprint on your mind and your heart that every gift you get, every gift you give, every kind word, every salutation, every happy holidays, Merry Christmas, whatever it is, that you would think about the idea that if I give this and someone were to reject it, what would that make me feel like? You say, well, where, where is this all seen at? Well, some of you know the story that it was no sooner than Jesus was born that then King Herod came and then put a decree out to kill all the babies that were between a certain age. So even then, what we celebrate as a great triumphal entry is then being rejected by mankind and Jesus and his family have to go to Egypt to hide. A gift given, a gift rejected. A gift not returned. Think about that for a second and what that might mean to you in your walk and how that might inform how you then filter all other relationships in your life. God doesn't want to just keep this on a Christmas thing. He doesn't want it to be the red and the green. He doesn't want it to be flashing lights and nice wrapped paper. That's all good. But he, I believe, wants us to go a little bit further with the idea and the concept of giving, receiving, and returning. But any time that there's that sequence, there's oftentimes opportunity for someone to reject. And if we reject, we'll never fully understand the quality of love that God has for us and mankind. Faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for you about decisions that we need to make on what type of love we will hold on to, what type of love we will fight for, what type of love that we will turn some things away from and turn to, the type of love that will be necessary in this hour to keep us stable and focused. And not topsy-turvy, but the type of love that says, I choose you, God. I choose you. In choosing him, it doesn't mean that you know everything about him. You just won't. And I know many of you thought you were doing your due diligence that you're going to marry somebody that you really knew them really well. But the truth is be told is that when we get into relationships, we find out there was so much that we didn't know about each other that we have already said I do too. Why can't we do that with God? Why all of a sudden with God, we have to know everything about him before we can say I choose you. I don't do it because I got to know every little detail in and out. You didn't do that with her or him or them. You just said yes. But today, I'm challenging you. Let your love, the quality of love, that your willingness to commit to God himself will grow greater and stronger because you realize that it's targeted towards you. You've been targeted. Not only have you been targeted by heaven, but you've been targeted by hell. And you need to realize this, that it is an hour for you to choose. A moment for you to choose. Will you still be fickle? Will you still be riding around on highs that are dictated by the economy or seasons of life? Or will you be in something more stable, something more rock steady? The type of love that we're talking about today. Not the type of romantic, sexual, intimate love, but the type of love that's, uh, that's only given by grace only received by grace. You're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I've just, I haven't. I can't really make a whole bunch of excuses up. I got a lot of things I could say, but right now I'm aware, intimately aware, that I thought I was smarter than all those other Christians. I was smarter than everybody else who'd ever became a believer, and I was just refusing that idea because I was just smarter than them. But today, now in this moment, there's something going on inside of me and I can't, I can't figure it out. I don't understand it. I'm thinking something and I'm challenging myself in some ways. There's some ideas in my mind as I had this conversation with you internally. I'm not wrestling with me, but I'm wrestling with you. And I realize that if you're willing to wrestle with me, that means you really love me. For those of you, that's the conversation you're having. For those of you who are ready to make the decision to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, and receive, receive and not reject. 
the only way that you can truly return the type of love that the world needs most now. Won't happen in your own energy, your own effort. You can't love the God kind of love and the God kind of way in your own energy. It's just impossible. You can be a good person, but you won't be able to meet the standard. I want to pray for you. I think this is your day, this is your moment, this is your hour. If you're here, you're listening, I want you to pray this prayer after me. I want you to repeat it after me. Now, there's, no, there's nothing special in the prayer itself, but it's you making the commitment to make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. It's a choice. Just like any other love is, it's a choice. You're making a choice today, a conscious choice to trust him to put him first. Now, some of you may pray this prayer every week and you think you're getting saved every week. I just want to make sure that you realize that your salvation is not as fickle, just like God's love is not as fickle. So you can't all of a sudden lose your salvation from last week to this week just because you weren't the best person that you could be. Remember, it was never about your ability to be a good person. It's about his ability to take away your sins and the penalty of your sins. It's all about his grace, his mercy. Today, I want to pray for you that you would receive God's love and that you would be the better for it and that you would then receive the greatest gift the world has ever been offered but many times has been rejected. Today, I want you to make that choice. You pray this prayer with me. Just pray exactly what I say. It's not an incantation. It's not anything special, but you need to hear yourself say some things. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We're celebrating his birth. We're celebrating the fact that you've shown your love towards us and you manifested your love towards me specifically by sending him into the world over 2,000 years ago. It was good then and it's good now. I received the gift. I received the gift of life. I received the gift of redemption. I received the gift of purpose, clarity. Thank you. Thank you for sending that gift. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to receive it. Thank you for never turning away from me, even when I rejected you because I thought I was smarter than you. I thought I knew more. Or maybe I just hadn't been exposed, and now I'm exposed and I know and I realize that there's something going on that this pastor just couldn't make that thing happen in my life, but it's you who's doing it. I believe you came into the world born of a virgin. You lived a sinless life. You were crucified. You were buried. And then you rose again on the third day for my sins. And you sent your son into the world to save me. You may be saying this. I want you to pause for a second. You may be saying this and you say, I need to know, understand this and know all this. I'm telling you, you won't know and understand it all right now. But believe me, what you're feeling is not just a put on or come on. It's not, it's not some mental games that I'm playing with you or emotionalism. This is real life. God's spirit is working and moving in your life. I believe, repeat after me, I believe and therefore I am saved. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Now here, this is what you need to do. You said that prayer. You've made a commitment to make Jesus Lord of your life. You might have done it in isolation and by yourself. I challenge everyone who I lead to the Lord to do these three, this thing. Next thing, tell three people. You got to tell three people who weren't in the room, who are not here with you right now, that you made a decision to make Jesus Christ number one. And what that's going to do for you is then what? You're going to go public. You need to share that with other people. And one of those people need to be us. You need to share it with us. Let us know if you made a decision to make Jesus Christ number one. And this is going to help us then give you some next steps. What you need to do next, because this is not the end of the story, but just the beginning of it. Jesus coming into the world was just the start of something. It wasn't the end of something. I pray that God would comfort your heart now in this hour, that you would realize you're never alone. You're never alone. God intended to be that way. Now, those of you who are in the room, you say, Pastor, that's me. I'm, I'm saved. Love God then I want you to work on this one aspect. I want you to work on returning love. You've received love, now I want you to return it. I want you to return it in such a way that people would ask the question, 
how are you doing this? Why are you doing this? How is this possible with you? It may be that somebody doesn't like you, someone that doesn't, you don't like somebody and the relationship is on its rocks, but you're gonna return love. You're gonna return love and you're gonna be an example of what it looks like to receive such great love. You're gonna give great love. And that's gonna turn some people on their ear. They're gonna start asking questions or they're gonna be confused. They're gonna wanna know what is this all about? Let it be that we give the gift of love better than we do economic gifts or things that can be bought or sold or lost or stolen. Let us specialize in that type of gift. I pray God your blessing be upon your people. Make them strong and courageous in you in this hour and may they continue to remember that they give because they've been given to. In Jesus' name, amen.